Okay. Can you tell me what the great debate was all about? What was the issue at hand? The great Shapley Curtis debate of 1920 that you guys have sure have heard about. Standard in every every uh, elementary school in the science course, right? All right, so the idea was these guys were trying to figure out what, where are we in, in the universe? We've gotten to the point where we understand um, our place in our solar system, and we're figuring out some ideas about how uh, the universe works, how it came into being, how it expanded. But they weren't really sure um, if the Milky Way was a remarkable thing to have happened, or if it was pretty common. So they wanted to figure out um, where are we in the Milky Way, for one, and for two, where is the Milky Way in relation to some of the other spiral nebulae or other spiral galaxies that we can see. Um, so the idea, and what you're going to kind of reconfirm in this lab, is to use some of um, some variable stars, R Lyrae and Cepheid variables, to measure distances both in our galaxy uh, and beyond to other galaxies to figure out, one, um, are we at the center of our galaxy or are we not? And two, um, is our galaxy similar in size to other ones? Uh, or is it sort of a central point in the universe? My guess is that intuitively you guys have an idea for the answers to those questions, but you know, 100 years ago those were not sort of well known. So stars form from large uh, balls of gas and dust. Uh, you have this big cloud of gas and dust out in space, and gravity between some little particle and some other little particle will attract them to each other. And if over a long period of time you have enough time and enough material, will eventually attract enough material to, to itself or to each other uh, to create stars. So the process is it starts with some big ball, uh, they uh, combine and attract each other to make smaller and smaller fragments, and eventually those fragments form stars. And when this happens, uh, you get large star clusters, so large groupings of stars that form all at about the same time. Uh, sometimes these star clusters form in the disk of the Milky Way. So we have the Milky Way galaxy, which is this, this large collection of stars, star clusters, and other you know, gas and dust. Um, some of them form in the disk of the Milky Way, but some of them form uh, out of the plane of the Milky Way galaxy uh, in what we call the halo region, above and below the Milky Way galaxy. And so you'll have some uh, star clusters that form in this halo and they kind of just rotate around above and below, um, whereas the rest of them fall into this ordered disk. And so it's measurements uh, to these star clusters that form in this halo region, which we call globular clusters, that we're going to be interested in. And so if we can observe our variable stars in these clusters, then we can measure the distance to these clusters. Right? That's kind of the important part. And by measuring the distance along with their relative location in the sky, we call it galactic latitude and longitude, we'll get to that in a second, we can make what we call a top-down map or a projection. And so this is basically if we were sitting somewhere above the Milky Way galaxy, and we were to look down upon it, uh, what would it look like? So it's basically flattening everything we see down into a single plane. <clears throat> and all these globular clusters would have some distribution, and they'd primarily be concentrated on the center, because that's where the halo region is. And they'd have fewer out around the edges. And so if we make measurements on these RLA variable stars, and we make a map like this, we can presumably measure the, the um, approximate size of the Milky Way, the diameter, from one end to the other, and if we were to make this map along with a plot, of, along with a point for where the sun is located, where we're located, say it's over here, we can measure the distance from our location to the approximate center of this distribution. Right, so if we're out here, then that answers your question, we're not in the center. And if you find that the galactic center lines up pretty much with where the little dot of the sun is, and uh, we are on the right side. may have an intuition for which is true, but it would be very obvious once you form the exercise. So uh, then we have to take a couple measurements. One, approximate diameter of this distribution, and two is our approximate distance from the center. And now we're in the middle. Right, the second half of the procedure we're dealing with spiral nebulae or spiral galaxies. Uh, this is Andromeda. This is our nearest neighbor galaxy, one we will run into in some amount of billions of years. Um, don't worry, you'll be dead. Though, so it's not be dead. I guess that's always a problem. There are a number of other objects that just look just like this, and they all have a similar shape. Uh, but the basic point we're trying to figure out here is what's the relative size of these? Uh, we, we just measured the size of the Milky Way galaxy 
And so now we can look out in space. We can use Cepheid variables to measure the distance to these objects. And if we combine our knowledge of how far away they are with their angular extent in the sky, we can figure out their actual physical size. Okay. And so this is a, an equation, uh, sort of a equality that we've used a bunch of times for a bunch of different reasons, but just one more time. We measure the angular diameter, the angle that this object takes up in the sky, and we know how far away it is, and we can figure out the physical diameter. So, given here, the physical diameter is 2 pi times the distance away, that's just the circumference of this large theoretical surface, uh, circle, excuse me, times theta, which is the angular diameter. So, we image these objects, we can use measurements of Cepheid variables to figure out how far away they are, we can use afterglow as measuring tool to figure out what their angular extent is, we can then solve for their physical size. And then we can answer the question, are they comparable in size to the Milky Way or not, and how far away? Okay, so that's the basic idea. Uh, the procedure is relatively short, so any questions before we get started on that? Got it? Okay. Uh, so similar to latitude longitude on Earth, we have a concept called galactic latitude longitude. Basically what this does is it takes everything that's out in the universe, and if you were to look out in all directions, and you were to take a big knife and slice through the universe and just flatten it out, this is kind of how it looks like. So this is the celestial surface. <coughs> everything in the universe looking out and you should assign uh, a location to it, a latitude and a longitude, uh, basically make a grid on this uh, plot and you can assign values if you find some object out here would have a certain latitude and longitude, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Uh, so if we use uh, values for the location of these objects relative to us from our viewing location along with how far away they are, uh, we're going to use that information to make that projection I talked about earlier. So we have given you, for 30 of these globular clusters, the galactic longitude, the galactic latitude, and the average parent magnitude. So what's the only other thing that we need to know in order to measure their distance? <coughs> the absolute magnitude, thank you. So if we know the apparent magnitude, and we figure out what the absolute magnitude is, and we can measure their distance based on that formula from last lab. What's the absolute magnitude of an RLI reverse star? Nice, solid guys. I'm impressed. Uh, all right, so since there's 30 of these, uh, this would be a little bit tedious to punch out on your calculator. So I'm going to just show you an example of how I would do it using a spreadsheet in Excel. You don't have to do this. By no means you have to do this if it's confusing and difficult, which I know that a lot of people don't use Excel and it can be extremely frustrating for them. So I understand if you don't want to do that. The only reason I'm showing you this example is that uh, for the lab we're going to do next week, uh, there's a, a number of calculations, and it makes it a lot easier to do them in a spreadsheet, I think. In a, in a past life, I was uh, worked in accounting for a corporate law firm, so I'm pretty familiar with Excel, and I still think it's fresh. So, caveat, don't do this if it makes life difficult for you. Um, so what I've just done is I've given each of them a number, 1 through 30, and I copy over their apparent magnitude, and so I can just use this, fill in the form based on previous values, and just copy down the row and make things a lot easier. I don't have to punch it out 30 times. So we said the absolute magnitude of RLI variables was 0.75. Put that in the first one, copy it down to the rest. Very easy. I just enter the formula here based on the values in these cells and then copy it down similarly. It will just do the calculation for me. So the distance formula, anytime you're entering a formula in Excel, you have to start with an equal sign. So it's equals. 0 0.01 kiloparsecs times, it's a uh, shift 8, it's a little asterisk symbol, 1.585 raised to the power, that's the caret, which is shift 6, uh, shift 6, yes. And then it's the apparent minus the absolute magnitude. So it's this value in this cell minus the absolute magnitude, which is right here. Okay, so I've entered the formula based on these two values. It will calculate the distance for me. Done. And then you just copy this down to all the cells. They'll do it for you. I'm going to do a scene. We'll copy them and I'll show you the first page. Right. So that saves you having to do the calculation you calculate it 30 times. If you do this, I would still check a few, check the first couple, check some of the other ones just to make sure everything copied over correctly. But uh, I would try this out. It might it'll make your life easier next week if, if you get familiar with this kind of tools this week. Alright, so once you've done that, 
Uh, then you go over to our plotting program, and you make a scatter plot, and you have to measure the longitude, latitude, and distance for each of these objects. There is no copy and paste function, I'm sorry guys. I didn't write the program, so it's going to be a little bit tedious, that's all this is. Uh, it'll then assign uh, a point for each of the things that you put in here on this relative distribution. One note about this, um, we ask you to label uh, all the axes on every one of your plots with like the depth, like whatever that measurement is, and then the units. In this case, uh, it's just a relative distribution, right? It's a, it's a X and Y projection. So you can just leave it as X and Y, or you don't have to put a label on there at all, but include the units. And the units on this are not degrees. Okay, you're not measuring by too much, you measure distance. So you can use that so you include the units, but you don't include like an extra data label because it's sort of an arbitrary projection. Uh, plot title, don't forget that as well. Right, once you plot that up, this is not what it's going to look like, but you'll have some collection of points, like on that graph I showed you in the background. And in this case, there'll be one, this bright yellow one is the sun, which is our location. You'll then be able to measure the distance from the sun to the center of the distribution, let's say. It's not going to look like this. And then the relative size of the distribution from one side to the other side. Does that make sense? So when I ask you for those distances, our distance from the center and the size of the moment, you're just reading that out. Where will it show up? Uh, so you have to measure it. So it's going to make some plot that will look somewhat similar to uh, this one right here. It's kind of be like that. It'll be a bunch of points. It won't be quite this many, but a bunch of points. Uh, wherever the center of the kind of collection of points is, that's the approximate center, the approximate galactic center. And let's say that bright yellow dot was over here. Your distance from the center is just your approximate distance from that approximate center. And uh, the diameter of the is the size, just from one side to the other. The second half of the procedure is so we observe some spiral nebulae uh, with prompts. I think three of these are observable. So you are going to, uh, in this case again, you're given the apparent magnitude and the period. So in this case, how do we find the absolute magnitude? Perceptive variables? I think I heard some formula. But it's based upon the period. So the absolute magnitude for set variables is a function of the period. And so I'll, I'll write the formula on the board when I'm done here with that. Basically, just based on the period, calculate the absolute magnitude, and then do the exact same distance calculation with the apparent absolute magnitudes. Uh, again, I made a table in my spreadsheet for this. It's only three, so it might be more effort than it's worth in this case, but uh, if you want to do that, I'll show you. Alright, so you've calculated the distance to these objects. The last piece of information you need to know is their uh, angular diameter, and then solve for the physical diameter. And so you'll just pull up your observations in Afterglow. Uh, one caveat here, be sure to note in the directions it tells you to change the max and histogram to 90. Don't forget to do that, it's important. So we're actually like over illuminating this object. The reason being that we really want to see the edges of these spiral arms. Right? You notice if I go from back to 99, some of that on the edge gets it's not quite as obvious, but it's there. And so go down to 90. And you want to measure from the edge, the very edge of the spiral arm, down to the very edge on the other end. These are going to take up like most, if not the entire. Uh, Size of the image window, that's fine. They're going to be larger measurements than you see. It would be better suited to overestimate by a little bit than underestimate. So once you do that, you can use from our equation we have up here. You can use the distance that you just calculated for each, uh, along with um, the angular diameter to determine the true diameter. So you can get some physical characteristics about the size of these other galaxies. And if you're comparing that to the size of the Milky Way, you can kind of figure out is the Milky Way small? Is it big compared to other galaxies around us? Um, you know, and kind of get an understanding for 
if we're uh, sort of in a special place in the universe, or if it's sort of one of countless numbers of similarly sized objects. <coughs> so that's pretty much the idea with the last part. And that's basically the lab.